kidding. Hello, everybody. I'm Paul Stewart and Will Eggleston here from Genelec, and we're here to talk to you about, well, what we know about immersive. So where do we want to start? Well, let's start about this idea of going to immersive. Typically, people have stereo. They need to expand out. Yeah, and so the, the golden rule for stereo is that the speakers generally need to be plus or minus 30 degrees from the listening position or from center. That doesn't change in the immersive world at all. Um, and then moving into the surround, the center channel is the next piece of the puzzle that, that has to be dealt with. And um, that's traditionally been one of those places where people make compromises. And not sure if that's the right thing to do. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt there's a compromise to both the visual and the audio. You have to find the happy balance between the two. Yeah, and it's not one of those things where, you know, if it looks good, it sounds good. <laughs> you really do have to pay attention to the center channel for because for a lot of stuff, it's the anchor for the sound. It has to be as neutral as possible. And then when you're going into um, the rest of the channels where you've got sides or rears, um, their placement is sort of dictated by a lot of standards that exist. Um, you know, and then once you get to the immersive, then, you know, the next piece of the puzzle is, you know, hanging the overheads. Right. And there are always, again, compromises because if it's a freestanding, chances are that room was never intended to be this. There could be a doorway in the way of the rear speaker. Uh, with, the, with the overheads, you might not have space to put the speakers uh, in line where you absolutely would like to have them because of, you know, something, something in the way. Right. And, and, and as far as, you know, definitions go, as, as we continue through here, you know, this room here that you're looking at right now is what we would call a purpose-built room. And when you get the, the, not the opposite of it, but another way of doing uh, construction would be more of a freestanding type of situation. Yeah, we used to do that in this room. We used to do that in this room as well. And we had the freedom to be able to put speakers wherever we wanted to, uh, whether they were small or near field or mid field or what have you. But when we built this room, we wanted to take a different approach. So this was purpose built. You know, I get this question asked to me all the time when I'm talking to people about building uh, an immersive space. Um, should I connect it analog or digital? And that, that has, it really doesn't matter, right? We've talked about this before. No, the good news is that PCM audio is not like it was 30 years ago. So if you know that you have a good D to A upstream, and you want to feed our system or any other system, or even it's a straight analog speaker or monitor system, you, know, you just go analog. Yeah, I think the important thing, first of all, is, well, what's your monitor, play, you know? What controls volume? the volume? What controls the volume? Yeah. And if you can do digital, I would recommend it. I find it to be, well, whether it's purpose-built or freestanding, it's nice to be able to just send the cable to the left speaker, through, put it to the right. right. So a daisy chain, if you will. And, it, with our speakers, I mean, we have a network for the setup and calibration, and all that, and that's daisy chain too. So, like when we set up this room, that made it a little bit easier. I was, you know, bringing cables through the room. Right. Also, coming back to the idea of uh, freestanding or um, purpose built, we sort of brought the two together when we did the overheads with the uh, with the trussing. Yeah. The exactly. way we did it, which also helped for our positioning. And being yeah, I think the short answer is if you have a way of dealing with digital as a, as a way to distribute your audio, um, that's the way to go. It, it, it does, there's less cables, <clears throat> especially if you're using base management, where you've got to send all the audio feeds to the, to the subwoofer first. Um, in our particular case, we have a rack mount that does all the summation for all the main channels and it strips out the LFE channel as well in the digital world. And then there's just one cable that runs to the subwoofer. That being said, segue into monitor selection, right? I mean, we have a, a room that uh, we've been using forever. We've been very familiar with this size room. Uh, so when we selected our speakers, we had a, a, a good understanding of the distances that we wanted to be sitting at, right. and that helped dictate that. Yeah, this room is basically 21 feet wide by 20, 
six feet or so deep with another seven feet of base trapping in the back. And the ceiling is, um, well, the visible ceiling is about 11 feet high and there's another, I don't know, two feet above that before you get to the actual, you know, the dead ceiling above the structure itself. Um, and we know the characteristics of this room and we also know that for our purposes, we generally would be monitoring somewhere around 80 dB, um, maybe a little less, maybe a little bit more. Um, you know, if you're doing stereo playback for a rocker, um, you know, it's going to go louder than that. So, you know, in our particular case, we've got the woofer stands with 8351s, but because they're more or less freestanding, they're not bolted to the wall or anything like that, we can roll in anything we need. If we need a 1237 or a 1238, uh, we can do that as well. It's, but, you know, generally there are guidelines with regards to how close you're going to be listening and what your target SPL is. And whatever your target SPL is, you generally need, you know, 18 or 20 dB of headroom above that. And once you've understood that or once you've established that, it, it makes it much easier to go and figure out what speaker is going to do the job for you. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, the... The good news is that when you get onto our website and you start looking at our products, we specify all products exactly the same way. Whether it's a little 8020 or an 8320 or a big, huge 1236, I mean, they're all measured exactly the same way in terms of what their capacity is for SPL. And that sort of makes the choosing part of it easy especially if a customer calls us and, you know, they want to know, well, my space is this big and I'm going to be this far away. Um, you know, we can have a pretty good idea of, you know, pretty instantaneously where to, where to guide that person. Now, once you get into the immersive world, uh, Dolby has what they call the DART, D-A-R-D-T, mm -hmm. which stands for Dolby Audio Room Design Tool. And our products are listed in there. So once you have um, your listening distances in place and all the measurements that have been inserted into the worksheet, um, it's very dynamic. You do the pull downs. If your target SPL is 79 dB and you've chosen an 8341, um, that may work. But if your target SPL is higher than that, then you might have to have a bigger monitor at that point. Um, so we're, we're pretty familiar with that with that tool, um, and certainly the guys at Dolby. I mean, they invented it. They're mm -hmm. they're wonderful. They're yeah. wonderful with it as well. Let's um, let's talk about subwoofers now, since we're into the integration of all the speakers and how the subwoofers play into this. Because there's a lot of speakers now. It's a lot different than if you had two two channels and deciding what sub to have that would work best for that room? Yeah, this is a great subject because people often have this idea that <clears throat> subwoofers don't have much to deal with since it's a limited bandwidth and blah, blah, blah. Um, the reality is that if you have one channel going into that subwoofer and then you have the same coherent energy plugged into the second input and it happens to be on a pan pot, um, then you know that that subwoofer gain is going to go up by 3 dB, the, the amount of SPL. And if you haven't changed the volume pot, it goes up by 3 dB. And as you start to add more channels, whether it's a center or sides or rears, because these subs, you know, any good multi-channel sub that has base management built into it has the capacity or the you're enabled with the connections to have seven channels plugged into that. And um, you can see what's going on here, right? I mean, the subwoofer kind of becomes like <laughs> a balloon. And, you know, as you start to add more channels and depending upon the content, um, the, the subwoofer tends to keep doing this. And then you've got this other piece of the puzzle, the dot one. And the LFE channel is a separate channel by itself. It has nothing to do with the main channels. A lot of times that content is derived from an aux end or some other methodology. I mean, you know, in, in the Pro Tools 
that we that we use. It's in the it's in the panner itself. And if you want to add something into the LFE channel, there's a little fader that you go up, and it's very elegant in that in that regard. But you have to remember, the LFE channel needs to be reproduced at the subwoofer by 10 dB, and that's because perceptually you need to be able to hear that against all the other channels. So you can't think small when you're doing immersive with regards to the subwoofer. You, you just can't do it. Um, and if you have overheads, which is part of the immersive thing, um, you know, if you think your content in the overhead world is going to be full range from time to time, you're going to want to have a subwoofer for that as well. And so let's be real clear here. This doesn't turn into like a 7.2.4. It's still a 7.1.4 or 8 or 9.1.6. Right, because that dot refers to the LFE channel, not the amount of channels for base management. Or not the number of subwoofers. Or the number of subwoofers. Right? Yeah, this is kind of sort of happened in the consumer world where you know, well, I've got, you know, I've got a 5.2 system and I'm scratching my head and I'm thinking, no, that's not a delivery. Right. But, Even for that matter, when people say, well, I got a 2.1. You don't. You don't. <laughs> you have, two, you have, you have two stereo with a subwoofer. Sub <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, you could deliver content stereo with an LFE channel, but we digress. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Please. You see that this is like one of those pieces of the puzzle that irritates me. <laughs> Not as much as this mask. Oh my gosh. I know I'm fogging up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it minimizes the glare. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so subs and uh, let's talk about the overheads. I mean, here, I never thought we were going to put six up there, but when I look up there and I see six 8341s, amazing. Um, that might not always be the requirement. I think it has to do with, you know, the, again, the content, the size of the room, a few different things come into play. Right? Well, the native uh, playback, the, when you have, you have to have an understanding about, and I, I'm sure the guys, when they, when the guys at Dolby, when they do their presentation, they'll be very clear about what the difference is between beds and objects. Um, but the short story is that an object has it, it's its own piece of the puzzle and it has for lack of a better definition a gps coordinate that's mm -hmm. assigned to I it. like that and so as you move the joystick that object knows a very specific location and so if you go to a movie theater or if you go to a room that has more than let's say two overheads um, let's say you might have a, in a movie theater where you might have 10 or 20 overheads, uh, that GPS coordinate that's assigned to that object may very well put that sound effect exactly in that speaker. Um, if there's no speaker there, then it's going to average it out among some others. And that's basically, um, you know, that, that's, the sh that's the short analogy to that anyway. Um, but, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, okay, well, I'm doing 7.1.2, and uh, that's all fine. So let's deal with, okay, so you want it, you want two speakers overhead, all right? And you want them in a position according to the Dolby guidelines, or, or if you're using Aura 3D or something like that, there's a very specific location where all of these loudspeakers go. And, you know, we get a lot of questions from people, well, how do I hang them? You know, and our solution when we were doing freestanding stuff in here, or if we were to go to a trade show, or if we were doing an event at a dealership, um, we found that we found a very cool solution that you would find at any local dealership, which has to do with DJ lighting, yep. where you've got a nice heavy tripod, a nice pole that goes up, and some sort of trussing system with hopefully two inch pipes, then you just kind of hang the, um, you hang, you, you, you clip the trussing onto these poles and you can more or less have a very safe way. And um, you yeah. know, then you've got your speakers there. And the general guideline here is that if you measure from the floor to the ear and it comes up at 42 inches, well, 
the, the basic guideline is that the overheads have to be somewhere between 2x and 3x of that distance, minimal 2x. So if it's 42, it's 84 inches from floor up to the overheads. Um, and that's, that's the basic guideline that comes from Dolby anyway. And Aura has their own specifications as well. And we got, we got comfortable, we have been using that same system so many times, it was easy once we would go somewhere, you could already like put the tape on the ground, run your tape measure, knew where the, the stand would go up, where you'd run the, uh, the trussing. And um, I was really surprised, it doesn't take that much time. I mean, it's a little bit complex, but um, you know, when you get comfortable with it, uh, it goes together pretty quick. Yeah, I mean, if you're doing a freestanding situation in your home, and you don't want to be drilling into the ceiling, or you can't, this is a good way of, of making it happen. Yeah. And, it's, um, and it works perfectly fine. And you could expand it out. Uh, we've done a couple of different events out there throughout the time where maybe we had 10 seats, but we wanted to expand to 20 seats. Right. And just make it a little bit wider, a little bit longer. Right, and at that point, it's just a matter of how many of those sections of trussing you need to have to in order to expand that. But for the most part, I mean, if you're in a small, room where your listening circle is somewhere between oh eight and ten feet from the listening position well the overheads are going to probably be separated you probably need ten feet of expansion you know across over your head and that's not really that difficult to yeah. achieve it's not going to cost that much i mean all these things are rated for a certain weight uh, capacity and um, you know you're, you're better online retailers, uh, you know, just go to the website and just type in, you know, DJ lighting or trussing, light, yeah. lighting and trussing yeah. and you'll get a lot of different, a lot of different suggestions. So why don't we segue into a little pre-record of the type of mounting <clears throat> that we carry and what we've used in this room. All right, so we'll watch that and then we'll come back to this. All right, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some mounting options in our room for our overheads, as we mentioned, we're using a trussing system. This is the 8416 truss clamp, and it's nice and easy to attach to the speaker. You can see the plate here goes right to these threaded points on the back of the speaker, and it is a two inch diameter clamp. And then you can walk that right up to the truss. On the wall over here, we're using the 8402. What's nice about this mount is this is the base plate and it allows you to pan the speaker from left to right and pivot the speaker, angling it uh, down up to about 30 degrees. Handy little feature is the bolt. One of them has the line on it to mark the degree on the mount. So as you go down and you find the degree you need, then you just lock it right up. Another nice feature about that is this mounts to the wall, this mounts to the speaker. So you can just walk the speaker right up to the wall with this bolt through and drop it right into the little mounting point right there. And that'll hang it right and secure until you find what you need and tighten it up. So on top of that, when this mounts to the back of the speaker, you can see for the um, vertical position, it's mounting this way. If we needed to do a horizontal position, we would need the added T-plate right here. And that would mount to the same points. And this would mount to the T-plate, which will allow you to mount it to a horizontal position. Now, if you're using a smaller speaker and you're using this mount, you may need to use a different T-plate. This is the 8454. And what this allows you to do is leave access for the network connections on the back of our 8330s or 8331. You can see here it allows some more space and then you can put this mount here. We also have a smaller mounting option for this, the 8422, I believe I'm correct. All of this, by the way, can be seen on our website when you go to the accessories part. Uh, and it'll give you the nice uh, pictures, blow up view of it, as well as a little description about them. Okay, so moving on, we also have here on the table a short ceiling mount. So you can see here I've got a part, this is the base plate that would attach to the ceiling. 
and there's an opening here and an opening in the tube. So nice little feature. You can send your cables through here coming out this little slit here. And this part will attach to the back of the speaker like so, just like that. But you can see you can actually angle this completely straight down. So you have a lot of flexibility on how you're gonna angle your speaker. Now in those rooms where you have a drop ceiling, you have more space, maybe clouds, and, and in order to get to the real uh, firm attachment points, we have larger telescopic ceiling mounts. This is the 8444, and you can see here it has a top plate here. It is not screwed in. <laughs> Very secure, strong metal plate, and that would actually then screw into the uh, top of this tube. And as I mentioned, being telescopic, you can see the locking points right there. As we open this up, we can get pretty long. So we can get a lot of, uh, a lot of length out of this. And it, re it uses the same uh, bracket here as we showed you on the 8402. All right, so moving on now, we're gonna show you some of the freestanding stands that we have. Over here we have the 8331 sitting on the 8409 stand. Nice wide and flat plate so you can sneak this in under tables really easy. And it is adjustable. We have a little securing point here but this is uh, can be loosened up and lowered and raised. And another nice feature is all of our speakers have a uh, a stand plate that will work and lock into the isopod. So you can see these little pins right here. There's an opening at the bottom of the isopod that allow you to stick that right into the isopod and actually it holds it pretty firmly. You can see, that's it. and with the isopod you can position the angle. And I'm gonna turn this around and show you one other really nice feature. The isop isopod can be removed and secured to either side of the speaker. So if you wanted to put this in a horizontal position, easy to do and put it right back to the stand plate. Another stand that we have, this is the 8,400 designer stand, we call it. Nice feature here, large tube that allows you to put the cables through there and mount down through here and come out the back. So you can get a nice clean look if that's what your concerns are. Also, this plate is what connects to the speaker right here. And you just simply put it right into that top little bar there and that hooks it in. And this screw here will allow you to pivot the speaker to get the proper angle you're looking for. While this one here actually, when you loosen that up, will allow you to raise and lower the tube there. I think one of the last things we want to talk about quickly is um, calibration. Mm -hmm. and, and how important that is. There's no doubt that when we're in stereo, you know, we have those speakers, hopefully, the same distance from left to right and the same distance from those positions to the listening position. And when you start moving objects or content, even that's in the beds. When you start moving things around the room, away from the center, away from the left and right, it's, it's really important that the rest of the speakers all be time aligned to, to arrive at the listening position at the same time. And they have to be level matched. Um, and you know, before you even get into the whole equalization part of it, Right, without the level and timing management, um, the timbre shifts as you start moving things around the room can be pretty bad. And we don't want to think like a consumer here. We want to think like a professional mixer because all of these things are radically important. They're just really important from a standardization standpoint. So calibration is, is really, really important. And our GLM system is great in the sense that it does all of that stuff for you rather quickly. When 
you put the microphone in the listening position, um, the sweeps are generated by the software, by the speakers, and it takes basically about one minute per speaker to get the level, figure out what the timing distance is, and then also give some neutrality to the, the frequency response as well. Um, and this is, this is a great piece of the puzzle because time is very expensive. Now you can do this stuff manually. If you have a pink noise generator or you have a tape measure, but tape measures are great. You I should have one I'm, anyway. You should have one anyway, okay? Because <laughs> in the freestanding world, it's much easier to just move things where you need them well, to be moved. Anything you can do to minimize the amount of processing you have to do. Right. You know. But in, in, in that realm, I mean, certainly when you're in a, you know, in this room, we have things positioned symmetrically in the room, but they're not all equidistant to the listening position because of just that's just because of where the listening position yeah. is. Uh, the speakers that are furthest away are actually the rears, and the speakers that are closest are probably the wides. And without the ability to time align these things, um, it, things would not be correct. So trying to do this stuff manually is all well and good. Uh, it takes a lot of time. And and you have to save that someplace. That has to be stored someplace within the system. Now, in our system, it's all contained in the setup well, that's file. That's the benefit of it. That's the beauty of it. It's, I mean, you're, you're calibrating the monitoring system. It'd be nice if that calibration lived with the monitoring system. Exactly. So and the other thing I wanted to say about that was that, you know, when you, if we talk about what the room's intent is, okay, it's an, I'm building an immersive room for yourself and for somebody else, or is it just for the mixer? Because right. if you have another position, um, and that is an important seat, or you know, just you want to be able to sit back and make it like you're watching a movie. You know, we have a big screen in here for a reason. We have this for when we're sitting at engineer. But if we want to play something back or have more people, we're going to have them back here. Right. It'd be nice if you could calibrate that area, and that's and with GLM you certainly can. Right. And it's just as quick, and it's just a preset that you, or it's just a, it's just a a group preset that you select on GLM. Um, and it's and it's quick, it's efficient, and it stays with the it stays with the computer system. It yeah. boots with GLM, and you can store those settings in the speakers. But I, I think more importantly, that without getting into the whole technology benefit of the whole thing, it's having that understanding of what happens when you want to start moving things around the room and you want the timing aspect of them to be rock solid. Yeah. You have to have that in, in you know, it's, it's pretty basic in stereo, you know? Right. Um, and, but once we went to center channel and multi-channel, all of that stuff came into play. And now once you go upstairs and you have the ability to take a sound effect and spread it, yeah. there's a size control, yeah. and that will then make it from a point source and it'll spread it out to a whole bunch of speakers. And if they're not properly time aligned, that can be, there, there's a lot of comb filtering going on. Yeah, there. there's gonna be a lot of issues if you can't make sure that things are time aligned. Right. Remember, we have how many speakers in this room? It's a 916. Yep. So uh, it's so important that everything arrive where you need it to. Yeah. I mean, making those decisions is, is critically important. And, um, you know, there's no doubt that, and I have a big smile on my face <laughs> here, uh, there's no doubt when you're mixing in immersive, it's a whole new ball game. I mean, it is, stereo is great. Don't get, I have got nothing against stereo. I've got nothing against 5.1, but I am all about 714, 916, and being able to take and experience, you know, reverberation details, things that, you know, work right, things that you can experiment with. Um, I got, somebody sent me a file and it had, every track was an object, but the reverbs were in the beds. And it sounded amazing. Mm -hmm. It sounded absolutely amazing. So there's so many ways to go with this. And um, yeah, I equate it to this. Do you remember when you were a kid and you you went to the record store and you bought 
a record and you were so excited, you couldn't wait to get home and listen to it. You're looking at it and when you got home and you put your headphones over, you got lost in it. Yeah. Same yeah. feeling came back to me when we started mixing in this room with all these speakers. Yeah, yep, it's, it's a good thing. So let's close it out. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed uh, this, this talk about immersive and monitoring in the immersive world. Absolutely. Thank you all for, for hanging out with all us. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.